welcome to Raising Joyful and Resilient Black Children podcast, where we bridge conversations from parenting to child well-being and social justice and provide resources and tools for parents connected to research that matters to us and to our community. I'm Dr. Valerie Adams Bass, and I'm filling in this week for my co-host, Dr. Sharita Butler Barnes. But without her, we're still going to do a wonderful job. Let's get started. Today on the show, We're going to explore the topic of Black mental wellness and teens. That's who I usually work with, so I'm super, super excited. Promoting accessible mental health resources. We're just beyond excited and joyful to welcome a special guest to join us in this conversation. And our guest this evening is Dr. Danielle Bugsby, a licensed clinical psychologist and co-founder of Black Mental Wellness Corporation. She's going to discuss the organization's mission with us and initiatives, as well as the newly released Healing Racial Stress Workbook for Black teens and provide helpful tips for parents and teenagers to address mental health. Dr. Bugsby, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for such a warm welcome. I'm so excited to be here to have this conversation today. Great, great, great. Dr. Busby, do you prefer me to call you Dr. Busby or Danielle? What do you prefer? Feel free to call me Danielle. Okay, so Danielle, I'm Valerie versus Dr. Adam Spare. So I'm Valerie, this is Danielle, and we're going to chat this evening. Thank you for joining us on the Friday evening. Can you tell us about your background just to get started before we delve into the topic? Tell us a little bit about your background and what inspired you to create Black Mental Wellness with your colleagues? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, my name is Dr. Danielle Busby, and I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. And growing up in Detroit, I got to see a range of different outcomes and circumstances, and I really saw the interplay of mental health. And so I also noticed that within the Black community specifically, we weren't always having conversations about mental health or the role that it was playing. And, you know, as I went on to do undergraduate training at the University of Michigan, and I went on to my doctorate program at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., I realized that there wasn't enough discussion about it, conversation about it, research about it. And I felt really passionate about ways to increase awareness, decrease stigma around mental health and mental health treatment in the Black community specifically, and really emphasize strategies like coping mechanisms, et cetera. And so Dr. Nicole Kamek, she's our president and CEO of Black Mental Wellness. She was kind of the leader in bringing us all together. Three of the four of the founders went to George Washington University. We were in the graduate program there. And Dr. Sharon Lambert was our advisor, but we were there at different times. And so that general connection kind of brought the three of us together, as well as Dr. Dana Cunningham, who worked with Dr. K. Mack at a different point in her training. And we just all had this general passion for ways to decrease some of the barriers that we saw to treatment, as well as just like the available resources to people that look like us. That is awesome. And that's a mouthful. So I just want to ask for you to just unpack a little bit. And we have lots to talk about in our short time together. Would you tell us a little bit first, it sounds like you had good training, good mentorship that brought you together, even though you, you know, maybe your academic paths didn't intersect. It's wonderful that you now have this organization to help Black children and Black families. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And kudos for the dynamic training that you received, as well as seeing the need and responding to it. So when you say it wasn't talked about, you know, it wasn't a conversation, it wasn't being addressed. Can you give us a definition that we can understand and bite into for mental health and what you mean by it wasn't talked about or it wasn't being seen? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for even asking that question to make it even more clear in the sense that when we say it, we're talking about anything related to mental health. So that's formal diagnoses, that's symptoms of stress, just more generally. And sometimes in the Black community, specifically, we felt like if the conversation went to something specific to mental health, there was a hesitation, there was a pause as it related to connecting. And we sometimes saw that as a relationship to other aspects of the Black community that interfered with that. So maybe thinking that like when we talk about Christianity or spirituality, for example, like you're not Christian enough if you're having these problems or maybe you're just not believing hard enough. Right. Like so those are examples. But Dr. k she talks about how she was working in the VA at the time and she was working with black women. 
And she noticed that there weren't many resources that really spoke to them. And so she actually went home and found like an Ebony Magazine article that talked about this idea of like the strong Black woman and how that's impacting our mental health. And she used that in her therapeutic sessions. And so thinking about the fact that there wasn't everyday available resources for clinicians in this way, you know, we became really passionate about like, how are we actually speaking to this patient population in a way that's meaningful, that's connecting. Sometimes people will come in for treatment but then we won't, sure. won't see them for some time because maybe they don't feel like they're understood or there's a connection. So these are all things that we were seeing in our own clinical work and we want to do something about it. Awesome. Thank you for sharing and giving that depth of context. So what is mental health and where do we see it? And what does it look like? Or what are the conversations in our community as well as in the professional you know, context? So this idea that I know that APA has standards or multicultural standards for clinicians, but perhaps they were not meeting the needs or helping support clinicians who work with Black families, Black women. I know today we really want to talk about working with Black teens. We might have to circle back on another day or time to talk more about Black women. So when you're thinking about that, how does your organization, because you did mention that even this idea of reaching out for Ebony or Essence magazine, of integrating that into your clinical sessions, How does your organization provide access to evidence-based information, right? Because your client may not necessarily sit around and read, right, a clinical article. But if you're using these resources, both evidence-based as well as layman's resources, you know, how do you make those and provide access to your clients and what other resources about mental health and behavioral topics do you share and provide that speaks to a Black context acknowledging that Blackness and a Black identity is not monolithic. Absolutely. I love that question as well. And, you know, our goal was to really think about what is someone going to really understand? So sometimes I make the joke that when we talk about mental health or we talk about different providers, I feel like it's alphabet soup. There's a bunch of different acronyms at the end of someone's name. And if you're looking for a provider, you may or may not know What do all those things mean as it relates to their training? What do all those things mean as it relates to how they're going to present in a session? And so I think sometimes we put too much pressure on the individual to know these aspects of our field and we don't kind of make them accessible or we don't explain them anywhere. And so one of our missions was to answer some of these topics. So on our website, which is www.blackmentalwellness.com, we offer free resources related to these various mental health topics. We offer fact sheets around a range of different mental health disorders. We offer a range of different ways that we can think about coping that doesn't have to be in this traditional aspect. And I think that's been really helpful. We also have a really strong social media following where we're able to produce material that is based on what we know from the literature, but it's just presented in a way that the everyday person can really understand and then utilize. Because I think sometimes in academia, we get caught up in what looks the best? How are we presenting it? And presenting it sometimes in this very academic way. And it's not always you know, effective for the person that doesn't understand academia. It's a very small percentage of, you know, the people that I'm really passionate about changing things for, you know what I mean, that understand some of these aspects. And it's not a matter of intelligence or not. It's just a matter of exposure to the topic itself. Sure. That makes sense. And also, I would add that APA, the American Psychological Association, does have multicultural accreditation where therapists, clinicians do have to have the professional development, but it doesn't necessarily require it to be on working with Black patients, right? Black parents or Black children. So thank you for your resource for having the websites that's specific to Black families and Black children. And so I have a question that sort of bridges both. So you mentioned this idea of serving Black women and Black women who may be addressing or trying to deal with the superwoman phenom. So we have Black parents who come in or may come in and are coping with racial stress and not just their own racial stress, but how do they support their children, particularly in this period of time where we're coming through Black Lives Matter, we're coming through, you know, this persistent media-based cycle of violence towards or against Black children, Black women, Black men. And so how did you move into this book and move into, we need to be specific in how we support teens? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that question as well. So I'm a child psychologist. I primarily work with children between the ages of about five to 17. And so this is kind of like my everyday. When I think about my team holistically, at some point we have all had specific exposure or research expertise or clinical expertise expertise and working with adolescents specifically. So I just kind of like to say that as a kind of broad stroke for kind of how this area, I really think about it as finding us. 
And, you know, the first tip I always try to give parents is that, you know, kids are watching you. They're paying attention to you. They're paying attention to how you're responding to things and what you're doing. And so remembering that you're really a bottle for them, for dealing with stressful things, for dealing with the unfair realities of our world, right? And so how you talk about them, how you relate to them, how you engage with them, your child is going to follow. So I encourage parents to be honest. I encourage parents to have the conversations and have them often. So that's a very normal part of their existence with their child and that they can have an understanding of where their child is on the range of those topics you presented, right? It's so much that can be said about how we can go about this or what's best to do, but it's really about being engaged in that process with your child that you can take each step, one step at a time and in alignment with where they're at and what they're being exposed to. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I agree with that. And You know, a lot of my work, as well as Dr. Butler Barnes, we both tend to focus on adolescent development in our work, right? And do intervention-based work, the research that helps inform how we think about or how practitioners work with young people, particularly teenagers. And so I'm just wondering, you know, sometimes teenagers cannot be verbally expressive, right? They may not be verbally expressive or they may not necessarily, not all teens, but some teens may not be immediately expressive about something they've experienced at home or something they've experienced more importantly, or just as important as school or on the way to school or on the way from school. I think about a workshop I did on racial socialization and the young man, you know, waited to tell his mom about a racial encounter he had. So how do you address that? How do you bring parents to terms with how they cope? And then what do we do in terms of tell us what the book does and how the book helps young people? Because some young people are going to come home and tell it all or they're going to get on Twitter, right? Or they're going to make a little video about it or going to be on YouTube. But some young people are going to think about it you know, and think about how is my mom or dad going to respond to this? How is my garden going to respond? So what are the key elements of the book that speak directly to teenagers in a way that parents can support them? Yeah, such a big question. So many different components of it that I really want to respond to when I hear the question, like, how should we use this book? Like, I love that it is a physical, tangible entity to begin a conversation. And I think sometimes parents, that's the first thing they tell me, that they struggle so much with like, how do I start this conversation? What do I say? Where do I go? They almost want me to like copy and paste exactly what is the words that I'm supposed to say because it feels overwhelming, because it's really important, because it's an emotional conversation. I like to let parents know like the things you're feeling around this conversation are normal. They're expected. Whenever you're talking about the safety of your child and you want to educate your child on what that looks like and what that means, we expect you to have big feelings about it. So I like to, you know, let parents know that that's where we're starting and that's okay. And then moving into that, like have fun with it. I love that our workbook really lets kids be creative. It lets them be intentional as it relates to planning or thinking about things. So yes, we know some of these things happen. Sometimes I think kids need to know that, you know, they can relate to other youth around this or they're not the only one that's experiencing it but it's all about acknowledging that it's happening and then what are we going to do about it and I love that the workbook provides so many different strategies for how to explore it how to have conversations about it how to explore it deeper and that's why I think it really speaks to a range of different ways in which we can approach teens at different developmental stages right your preteen may be more open your older team may be too cool. You might need to give it to them and let them mm-hmm. hang out with it sure. for a while. And that's right. cool. We're cool with that. But I think it allows to begin the conversation and to begin some processing around the very real thing we're all worried about and, you know, trying to come up with tangible ways of responding to. Right, right. So I want to follow up with a couple things that you said, because as you said, right, there is a continuum in that adolescent lifespan, right? Whether they're preteens, mid-teens, whether they're in their early adulthood. And so when you think about the book, I have maybe two questions. Is this something that you find yourself recommending parents share with their young people? Or is this something that you're seeing young people and you share with them directly? How do you introduce the book into the context? And does this become part of therapy? Is this therapeutic homework? How do you see this book being used? Or perhaps it's a family that therapy is not accessible to them financially. That's another conversation. Or perhaps they are in a space where they're feeling like, you know, I don't know if this is the best thing for me. So what do they do with this book? How do they 
access this book and how do you use it? Absolutely. So the beautiful thing I think about this book is that the various different people involved in this exposure, context involved, is how we envisioned it when we created it. So depending on who you are to a youth will really depend on how you introduce this book, right? So if you're a parent, for example, the way in which you introduce it can range in a lot of ways. It can be more intimate. It can be in thinking about how to use other everyday strategies like going to a cultural museum, watching a cultural show, things you do with your youth already, right? But then we're going to expand on it by exploring these additional things. Maybe you haven't started that conversation with your youth and you want to have a catalyst for how to do so. That can be the beginning and you can explore all these different ways of doing so from there. If you're someone's teacher, what are you seeing your students experience? What are you seeing your students being exposed to? What activities from the book really speak to that for them? What parents may need access to the book from them? Are you a mental health Absolutely. provider? I know one of my favorite images in our like extra worksheets that we provide for free online is like the image of the body It has a really cool little Afro, which I was intentional about making sure we included in the book. But it shows Mm -hmm. like where in the body do you feel the things, right? Like we all feel anxiety. We all feel stress. Helping youth identify. Is it in my chest? Is it in my stomach? Is it in my hands? Like what does that look like and what does that mean? If we increase their awareness, we can increase their ability to then change that cycle for themselves. So I think it can, you know, show up in a lot of different ways in a lot of different settings. And that's why I'm so excited about it. Great. And I agree with you. And it's, you know, one of my mentors, Howard Stevenson, who does a lot with the recast theory and racial socialization. We talk about that. He wrote the foreword. Where you feel. Right, right, right. Locating where you feel. Exactly. So you know exactly what he talks about. And the same as you, like, where are you feeling the anxiety? So that's super important. And then I think the other thing to talk about or think about really is there are some parents. So racial socialization is this process that parents are going through to ideally, right, to prepare the children to navigate living in the racialized society where they're going to be seen differently. But we do know that there are some Black parents who don't have that conversation, right? There are some Black parents who may decide that I live in a particular zip code and that protects my child. And perhaps there are fewer of those children after COVID-19, after seeing so much of the violence against Breonna Taylor, against a George Floyd, you know, starting way back with you know, Trayvon Martin, but there are some parents who don't know how to have that conversation, right? And then there are some Black children who are being raised by non-Black parents. So absolutely, you know, how do you share this book or the idea that you can share this book as a starting place differently for those parents from those parents who may already be proactive? I like the idea that different parents can approach it in different ways. I do want to follow up and see if you can give us some examples. You mentioned that when young people are using this book, they can be creative, (laughs) that they can be thoughtful, depending on where they are. So can you give us like some bullet points or the types of ways that young people can engage with this book? Yes, absolutely. So first I'm going to answer the question related to how can different parents from different circumstances really engage with this book? One thing I always tell parents when I'm working with them is that if we don't explain things to kids, if we don't give them an explanation, they are left to discover their own or to develop their own. And so if we're working with an eight-year-old, it's going to be at an eight-year-old level. If we're working with a 10-year-old, it's going to be at Absolutely. a 10-year-old level, right? And so I always mm-hmm. encourage parents, no matter how difficult that conversation is, no matter how awkward it may feel, maybe how you never really plan to ever, ever do this, et cetera, have that conversation with your child because if you're not having it with them, they're figuring it out for themselves and they don't have an adult's perspective with their best interest in heart guiding that discussion. And so whenever I kind of frame it for parents that way, I'm able to kind of get some buy-in about, you're right, no matter how difficult it is, we can kind of begin that discussion. And so how do we do it? How do we make it creative? How do we make it fun? It's so many different strategies. So some of it is through like artistic expression. We know that kids show up in a lot of different ways. So we make areas in the workbook where kids can draw. Some of it is kind of looking at a case example or a scenario of some kid that they maybe they relate to, right? And what they went through and how they relate to that series of situations or steps and where they kind of fit in with that. We really wanted to be diverse in our way of approaching the topic because we want to engage all kids, right? And so kids are diverse. And like you said, Black people are not one particular way. We exist in all these different ways. So we tried our best to be, you know, inclusive of that experience in its entirety. Great. I'm so glad to hear that. And I think it's good for our audience to think about that too, because oftentimes we do run into, when we're doing research, particularly if we're doing empirical data collection, we will run into parents who say, I don't know what to do with this, or this happened. I never expected it to happen. 
happen. And in my work, when I look at media, so I love this idea of culturally congruent image, right? The conversations that young people have around, you know, what they're seeing and what, you know, how they're represented in the media, like, and their thoughtfulness about it or how people they know are represented in the media. So I'm so glad to hear that, you know, there's a variety of ways that young people can engage on their own and then maybe use that to start a conversation with their parents or with their therapists. I think they're both important spaces because oftentimes what we find with young people, particularly high school age young people, is this idea that, right, they're moving into a space of autonomy, of decision-making and making choices and then there's this expectation that they're from some, there'll be an expectation that they're mature and particularly an expectation that they're overly mature if they're black mm-hmm. girls, sometimes black boys, right? So the research demonstrates that. So, you know, then what do they do, right? When people are expecting them to behave as if they're adults when they're really not, or perhaps the assumption is they don't need the sources or support. And what we know is that they too need the sources of support even more so sometimes than their peers. So absolutely, so much. Absolutely. Right? And how do they decipher who is who? Particularly when we talk about the diversity of Black families, right? And so we even mm-hmm. have a section about what does this look like? Who can I go to? How do I know if they're safe? How do we kind of think about that connection and what to do if it's not there, right? Because that's the reality for some people. I love it. Yes. Um, and then, you know, how are we defining family even, right? So how are we defining family? Absolutely. Who is safe, right? So that safe person may or may not be a family member or may or may not be someone in your school. So I love it. Thank you. Thanks for making sure that it sounds like you, you all have hit everything, you and your colleagues in that way. I do want to, you know, just continue to talk about how your organization really thinking about how Black mental health wellness and, you know, how are you helping to diversify mental health? You know, so you saw a need, as you said, the need kind of came to you. You all are trained in some way of working with adolescents or young people, as well as other members of the Black community. So as you think about your website, you think about your social media presence, you now have this awesome book. How do you see or do you see your organization being influential in this psychological space, this clinical space where the work is needed, as you all said, and you said even in your training, Danielle, like, I saw the need. So how do you see now that you have this presence, maybe your influence? Absolutely. So I'm so proud of our team. We've been really intentional about the ways we've gone about this. One, we have a national training program where we have a number of mentors. We have about 20 mentors approximately each year that then take on mentees. And these are all people in the mental health field. And this is all about you thinking about college, graduate level students that need support and mentorship as it relates to wanting to be in the field of mental health. We partner people up and we want to, you know, use this as a platform for them to grow, right? A lot of times people tell us, I've never had a mentor. I've never had a mentor that looks like me. I don't know how to begin to navigate engaging in the mental health field. And so we need to make it something that's accessible to people of a range of different, Mm -hmm. you know, ethnic backgrounds, right? So that's one way in which we do that. We also do a series of trainings as it relates to corporations, school districts. You know, sometimes people just want us to come in as it connects to their sorority, for example, or their public health service organization. And we speak around a range of different topics related to mental health and wellness generally, but as well as it relates to the Black community. And then additionally, we hold an annual conference. It's a virtual conference where we focus on a range of factors related to the mental health of the Black community globally. And so we have different healing circles, different breakout sessions. And, you know, Mm. we do spotlights of a range of different professionals because we want to show that it looks a lot of different ways. I think sometimes when we say mental health professional or wellness advocate, we think of a very Mm -hmm. certain you know, demographic or a certain image. And what we know is that, you know, your hairdresser can be somebody that you really relate to in that way. Your barber, your nail tech. And it doesn't always have to be this professionally trained individual, a spiritual leader. It's so so many different ways that can look. So we use our platform to highlight those individuals and the ways in which they're showing up for the wellness of their community. And so, you know, we're continuously growing. We're continuously developing new ideas. We have merchandise from the Authentically Me collection, which was all our individual stories for why mental health and why the mental health field means so much to us. And we created t-shirts and, you know, we have journals coming out. We have a range of which ways in which we want to connect with people because we get, like you said, Black people are not one way. So different aspects of the ways in which we exude this is going to connect with someone. And that's our goal. We really want to bring people to have this conversation, to be intentional about their health and wellness, because I feel like we're the group of people that have the most reason to have stressors, right? And sometimes have the least resources to get support around them. 
Sure. No, I think that's awesome. And so I do want to double back to, you know, so let's say that, well, two things I want to double back to, and then I, I want to talk a little more about the workbook. So, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, and you know, as well as I do, or more as a clinical psychologist, Danielle, that there are, you know, multicultural requirements by the American Psychological Association, also by the Association of School Counselors and Therapists. Mm-hmm. So I do wonder if any of the professional developments that you offer the conference meet those requirements, those continuing education requirements, that's part one. And then part two, let's say someone is listening to this podcast, please listen to us and then get all of this rich information. And then they decide, I want a therapist who has been exposed to the Black Mental Health Wellness Network, to the Black Mental Health Wellness Resources. How can I determine if this therapist has attended that training or has these resources are connected in some way, because it kind of feels to me like this might be the type of therapist that I'd be willing to trust or at least to attempt to develop a relationship with. I love those questions. One of the resources that come to mind is that we have actually on our website, a list of questions to ask your therapist on that first or second session, right? To kind of think about, is this a good fit? And so if that is something that's really important to you, you want to make sure that you ask those questions early on about their training, because it's a matter of fit. Like what feels good to you? What do you need in that relationship to really do the work that's going to be most beneficial? Also, in thinking about resources, we always try to be intentional about, you know, really assessing like when we do workshops for corporations or companies, like are you really committed to the work that we're talking Mm -hmm. about and how Mm -hmm. do we kind of give the appropriate resources, right? And so I think that the APA does a good job of outlining what that looks like. And I think as a field, we can continuously do a better job of assessing like, is this really meeting the need of the students that are being trained, et cetera? Or are there ways that we can enhance this? So we are, for the first time this year, we're working to have CEs for our virtual conference. And so that we can be able to do that work more widely. It's also just a learning curve for us. It was our first time putting together a conference and learning about what's needed to even host a CE session, et cetera. So we're excited to, you know, have had people along for the ride from the very beginning with us as we move into that next stage of training. Sure. I'm glad to hear that. And Dr. Mia smith Bynum at American APA, you know, Mia? Yeah. Yeah. She is doing a lot of work around moving their diversity, equity, and inclusion work into, you know, a practice practical space so that, you know, it isn't so difficult to find therapists that are ready and willing to work with Black children and Black families. So I'm so glad to hear that continuing education credits are coming up for you. That's so exciting. And when we write about, I write with the clinical psychologists as well, and we always have practical recommendations, even in our academic work. And we often say that we want to see like requirements that ensure that you're going to get a teacher who understands Black history, that you're going to get a therapist that is sensitive and they may not have the diversified strategy of how they work and the types of therapy that they use, but they have some knowledge of working with members of the Black community and that needs to be of requirements. So I'm so glad to hear that with the wealth of training and resources that you are now going to be offering continuing education credits. Yay! Yes. (laughs) And so the segue back to our wonderful parents. I do wonder, we talked about this a little bit earlier and we're thinking now about the list on your website. So we're going to make sure we share that with our audience, like questions to ask your therapist. So how do we ensure that parents are, you know, thinking about this journal, this workbook, if they're accessing the website independent of their children, how do we ensure that parents are able to use these resources in a way that they can support their teens? So whether they've got that tween that's between 11 and 13 or you know, their child is in high school, they've hit their stride and they're coming into some encounters. What are some practical takeaways that you can say to a parent, do this or do that or try this or try that? Absolutely. So first, again, I think sometimes when we talk about this topic, parents tell me they're like, OK, I'm going to have the conversation or how do I have the conversation? And it insinuates that it's one conversation. The reality is it's many. Right. So we have to, like, open our mind and expose ourselves to the idea. It's not having one conversation. It's not done after one time, much like many other things that I hear parents say that you have to remind kids of multiple times this is not one and done (laughs) right like this is going to be that conversation it's definitely not one and done 
one, especially this topic. And I think too, it's important again, like I think modeling is a really important thing. So I think you can be honest with your kids. I think sometimes we don't think kids are as resilient as they are and we want to shield them from a lot and it leaves a lot of holes in regards to their understanding. And so I actually encourage you to be honest with your kid to a developmentally appropriate stage or level, right? About the realities of your own feelings. So when you see unjust things happen in the news, naming like, wow, I'm really sad about this thing that's happening and I don't really have the words to explain it. Or I'm wondering how you're feeling about it because I'm really feeling a difficult way, right? I think sometimes that vulnerability as a parent, you feel like you need to know it all. You need to have all the answers. You need to make the kid feel like, you know, it's all okay. And I think sometimes that honesty really does expand the conversation. And then engage the work. Like there are so many different activities in this workbook. There's, you know, for you to know, more for you to know, more for you to do different sections for you to really explore different levels of it. And so, I mean, you don't have to rush through the book. Take your time. What are ways that you and the family can engage in some of the activities that are presented? Or are there situations that your child has experienced that you can relate to something in the book as a way to kind of say, like, you're not the only one experiencing this. So I can think of so many different ways that those conversations can begin. But I think in just, you know, being open to the multiple different ways it can go, I think it can really serve to be beneficial for youth experiencing racial stress and having a pathway to talk to adults about it. Absolutely. So I have two questions related to what you just said. I'm a digger, right? <laughs> I do uh, <laughs> multi-method research. I'm always having the survey and saying, can I ask you a few questions in addition to the survey? So I do want to ask, you mentioned this idea of there's more than one ways, there's a variety. And we've talked early on about, you know, hesitancy that may occur in the Black community or therapists being unprepared So what can we do or how does this book, how does your organization, in addition to sharing evidence-based information, help to address a stigma that may still exist within the Black community about mental health, right? So this idea of mental health. Right. So when we talk about stigma, one way to address stigma is to continuously have the conversation, right? Sometimes when we talk about stigma, we're trying to quiet the conversation or, you know, push, like see it as something that's not okay to do. And I think I'm really proud of where we are and the fact that, you know, celebrities talk about this, athletes talk about this, like we have more and more people being willing to have that conversation. When I think about stigma, I also just think about sometimes there's just a lack of knowledge, like we have these ideas about what mental health is that don't actually fit what we know it is, right? And so as we continuously can talk about it in a way that a range of different backgrounds and people can understand it, I think that we have growth in that area. And we got to, like, I think as a field, we have to meet people where they are. I think sometimes we get like caught up in the academic world or the medical world of things. And we forget the everyday like importance of like general understanding across things. It doesn't have to have this big fancy word to it. Like, can we explain this in layman's terms so that more people can be able to access and use the information. I think all those things are really important. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I have a part two short question, and then I know that I'm going to get the nudge, but we could talk about this ad nauseum. We keep talking. However, I did want to know, how does this work when you have a Black child or a biracial child who's perhaps being raised by a parent who's not Black? And they know that they need to have this conversation. They, you know, like many parents, we want to protect our children. That's why we may be uncomfortable having the conversation or figuring out when to have the conversation because we do want to protect our children. But we also know that, you know, within a Black community with Black children, we often have to have these very pragmatic conversations. So what does that look like? Or what would you tell a parent who is raising a biracial child and that child is having to manage that the racial stress associated with that or a parent who is raising a black child that they've adopted how do you start this conversation in a way that really speaks to what that child may be experiencing yeah i love that you asked this question because i think it needs to be included in the conversation always and you know i've worked with different families with a range of different backgrounds and you know, one thing I think that needs to happen from the, like, similar to what I just said is that, like, we need to be able to have the conversation, like, if it is awkward to you, right, or in your mind, being able to name, hey, I recognize that I'm of a different racial background than you. And so sometimes this conversation may feel awkward to some degree. But I think it's important for us to talk about it because I'm your mom. Or I think it's important to talk about it because I love you and I want to make sure you're good. How do you feel about it? Like, I think there's still a space for that conversation to happen. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's 
segment into only people that look like that child, particularly if that person is their mother or it's a caring mm-hmm. adult in their life, right? I think what's awkward is to see the things around the world happen, know your child is being exposed to it, and we say nothing because that demonstrates something different. Sure. That demonstrates an absence sure. of the conversation, and we don't want to do that. So I always just encourage parents to figure out what are your one liners or what's going to be your activity or what's going to be your day field trip that's going to get you to feel more comfortable having this conversation. Or do you have other family members or people in your community that will participate in helping you have that conversation? So that isn't an off topic conversation for you and your Mm -hmm. youth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving some practical like here's how to do it. I'm sure that our listeners appreciate that. And just thinking about that, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, how can individuals in the Black community access mental health resources and support where either the financial resources aren't there or the therapists aren't there or their limited resources? I know that personally, I would say when I lived in Charlottesville, Virginia, I was driving two and a half hours to see a therapist. And when she checked online, she said, you're right, there are few therapists in your community. I said, I really don't want to put these miles on my car, but I do want a therapist who can appreciate and understand and have the credentials that I need. Since then, they've had more therapists, but there are communities where we know there may be none or one and they have a waiting list or the insurance doesn't cover it or maybe the therapists that are available only take cash. And we are all not privileged to be able to say, I can pay the going rate for a therapist. So how can families access the resources, either getting access to a therapist because they're limited or getting access to resources because they're financial limitations. Absolutely. So first I'm going to answer the part about how can we just get access when there's all these limitations? So when I always ask kids, are you eating? Are you sleeping? Are you moving your body? Sometimes there are some very basic things that I think we can do as individuals to set ourselves up for a more positive outcome, right? So exercise is something that definitely helps us feel better and boost our mood. Thinking about what's going in our body from a nutritional standpoint, right? Like in sleep, sleep is so important as it relates to our mood. So are those things happening for you? Beyond that, think about who your social support is. Who are you hanging around? What social support do you have available to you? Are there people that you could spend more time with because you think they're a really positive influence? That's an aspect of our overall wellness, right? And we know that sometimes, you know, these resources aren't available, but there are programs. For example, I work with a program. We do intervention via brief intervention. So it's up to six sessions and we do it all via telehealth. And this is for youth specifically, right? So see if there are those types of programs within your area, because if you live far away, sometimes having a virtual option is helpful as it relates to barriers. There are sliding fee scales available. Be sure to ask about those when you ask people who take private pay. You know, I'm really interested in services. Is there any way to do a sliding fee scale if I don't have insurance, for example? And then finally, I think another underused resource is mental health clinics on university campuses that have, you know, graduate students as trainees giving them mental health services. So, yes, they're not licensed professionals yet, but those are some of the professionals that have the most support. And, you know, there are licensed psychologists supervising those students on those cases. So I think sometimes we're afraid to engage in those as options, but they're really helpful when those additional barriers are up against us. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I think even if you are going to go to those resources, like as you said, at college campuses where there are clinicians in training, still take the list. Is that what you would say, Danielle? Still take the list on your website, right? The Black Mental um, Health Wellness website where you're saying whether you're going to someone who's in training or someone who's already has their qualifications, take the list with you so that you can see if it's a good fit, right? Because just because it's low cost or no cost, that doesn't mean that you want to continue a relationship that's not going to support your mental health. Would you say that? Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. But I just want people to know the range of ways in which you can look for services, because I think we sometimes think of it in a very formal and, you know, uniformed way of doing so. Absolutely. So I just want to thank you for sharing, you know, what you're doing, what you've been up to, all of the connections, how the project came to be, as well as the book. I'm super excited. I only have a seven year old, but I'm going to go ahead and get that. Get the journal anyway. She thinks she's 17. But I do want to ask you, and you did mention a little bit that you're going for the continuing education credits, which is awesome. Can you tell us what are some future goals for the Black Mental Health Wellness Corp? Tell us what are some future goals. 
Absolutely. So definitely we want to do into the continuing education credits. We want to continue to grow our virtual conference and ultimately make it a conference that's happening in person. So we'll need sponsorship. We'll need support as it relates to that. We're primarily based in D.C., so we would love to work with people that are, you know, located there. Additionally, you know, all of us are continuing to, you know, engage in our own training and growth as it relates to our different roles within the organization. If anyone is interested in mentoring a student that wants to be, you know, a part of of the mental health field, please let us know. We have a mentorship program. We have an ambassador program where if you want to engage with the Black Mental Wellness Network as it relates to being an ambassador for mental health in your different area or you're on your different college campus, we have internships available to students alongside the mentorship program are working on aspects of our nonprofit organization so that, you know, people that are able to donate for aspects of that can, you know, write that off as it relates to taxes and things of that nature. So, you know, we're doing a lot of different things to just continuously grow this effort. We have journals coming out related to the Authentically Me movement. And so, yeah, just visit our website. You can learn all the things that we're up to. Clearly, we, as I say it out loud, it's funny, you do it every day, but you don't realize like, wow, we're doing a lot. But we're just really passionate about this mission and we want to continue to see it grow. Absolutely. And so Danielle, I want to thank you. And I just want to emphasize a few things you said. So Black mental wellness, right? So we know that mental wellness is part of health, right? And so sometimes we don't think of it that way. They're bifurcated, but mental health is part of mental wellness, right? And so the idea is you said of maybe going for a jog, a walk, a talk. Earlier, you said it's not one conversation, it's a continuous conversation. So the idea that you're continuing to grow, you have these different resources that are available and connections that Black mental wellness are making. So in your own way, your organization is continuing the conversation. So thank you so much for, you know, stepping up and filling a need as professionals, right? Professionals who are credentialed, who know the work, who know the need and are choosing to serve it. And also to be honest and authentic with your own experiences, because I think that will help with the stigma that we see exist within our community about the supports that are needed to ensure that we do have Black mental wellness. So thank you so, so much. Do you want to tell us your hashtags? You want to tell us your website again as we wrap up for the evening? Absolutely. So you can find us online at www.blackmentalwellness.com. You can find us on Instagram at Black Mental Wellness. You can also find us on Facebook at Black Mental Wellness. And on Twitter, we are wellnessblack underscore. So thank you again so much for having us and being able to have this conversation. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. And how can the young people or the parents and adults or guardians or other clinicians who aren't used to having this conversation find the journal? Where can they find the journal? Where can they find the tool? That's going to be on our website. It'll be launching soon. We're kind of doing things related to the book and the journal is right after. If you want to go to our website and join our listservs, you'll get up-to-date announcements as it relates to when everything comes out. Okay. So they can get the book from the website and eventually they'll be able to grab a hold of those journals, the Authentically Need journals and other merchandise Merchandise. associated with Black. Okay. That's a lot. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So you all know if we missed anything or we're talking too fast, I tend to speak fast when I'm excited about a topic that you can go to the website or you can follow on Twitter and you can learn more about the resources that are available, the kinds of therapy. You can pick up the book if you're working with teens or you have a teen. Sometimes having a teen feels like working with them. So thank you, Dr. Bugsby, for sharing time with us this evening and telling us more about Black mental wellness. And we look forward to hearing more about the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you so much. 